We're talking about the healthy spirit-led church. What does a healthy spirit-led church look like? And, and I want to start here by talking about ecosystems. Now, I, as you know, I grew up a Midwestern boy. And after I graduated college, I packed up all my things and I drove across country. And it's beautiful, right? If you've ever done it, if you've ever driven across country, it is beautiful. But then you enter into Washington State and your mind is blown, right? If you're a Midwestern boy, you see hills for the first time. And the hills are enough to make me like, wow, this is beautiful. But then you begin to see mountains, right? And, and then as I was like living here and traveling around, do you know how many ecosystems we have in the state of Washington? It's absolutely crazy. We have like the marine ecosystem. We have the top of Mount Rainier. We have a desert. I didn't know this until a couple years ago. So I visited the Tri-Cities. I'm like, there's a desert in Washington State. It's crazy. It's crazy. You have the Palouse. You have the rainforest. We have an actual, like the like Olympic National Forest is unique. It's a rainforest within the temper. It's, I went deep on this. But there are all these ecosystems that are happening. All right? All these ecosystems. And an ecosystem is simply this. A community of organisms, a community of living things, I hope you get the picture of what I'm trying to go here, where, where, that are interacting with the surroundings, okay? In some ecosystems, it's very easy to thrive. Some ecosystems, it's like, not only am I surviving, but I'm thriving. In some ecosystems, it's just, I'm going to try to survive, right? I can't get my, deep, my roots deep enough. I can't even go, I can't even live on top of Mount Rainier. If they're an organism, you are just barely hanging on, all right? And what about us? We know this to be true. Each one of us are in a bunch of ecosystems in these relational ways that we interact with one another. If you've ever been in a toxic work environment, you can raise your hand if that's you right now, except for my staff. No, all right, all right. Wait, you don't you guys work for each other? No, okay, we'll talk about that later. If you've ever been in a toxic work environment, you're not thriving, you're surviving. You're, you're just trying to get to the, to the five o'clock. You feel that? If you grew up in a, uh, a dysfunctional house where there may be abuse, or there may be uh, just kind of insecurity within it. Uh, I myself did that. Like a lot of that was surviving for me as a kid, right? You, you're not thriving. Now people thrive out of it. I'm not saying that you can't thrive, but these are the things that you feel. And you see this in the church as well, right? That, that each one of us, when we talk about spiritual gifts, each one of us is the goal of thriving, not just surviving. And the problem is, is that we come into the church and we're like, what is it in for me? What is it for me? What do I like about it? What do I want in this? And you're just surviving when you start to ask that question. And instead you should be asking, how do I come into a church, a group of living organisms, that are coming together and say, this is the ecosystem that I could thrive in. And we see this because we find that no church is perfect. But when we were talking about healthy spirit-led church, we're going to be talking today about an ecosystem. An ecosystem of what this church is supposed to look like. Now, I, I want to be careful. I feel like the Lord has downloaded some stuff on me. This is going to be teaching. This is not going to be a rah, rah, here we go. This is going to be in-depth, okay? I'll try to get rah-rah as much as I can, and I'll try to talk as, as, as slowly as I can. But I feel like the Lord has downloaded on me on what does it look like to build an ecosystem where everyone's thriving, where everyone's thriving, because that's what it takes. Because hear me say this, no church is perfect. But what does a church look like that is striving together to thrive together? That's the goal. What does a church look like that's striving together to thrive together, to be a spirit-led church, to pursue holiness on the inside? Each one of us pursuing holiness. When we get together, pursuing holiness and then focusing on the outside because that's what the Lord has really, really downloaded on us is how are we becoming kingdom shakers and kingdom movers? And I've seen the growth coming out of this, all right? We're called to spread the gospel. So today... We are, our root text is 1 Corinthians 12, 27 through 28. Now, this is going to be a little bit different today. I'm going to break down the verses, and, and then I'm going to talk about kind of this, this vision that the Lord has given me that, that, that on how these verses are kind of supposed to interact with it. But this is inspired by these, these, uh, by these verses, okay? So this is not one for one. I don't want anybody to be like, Theologically, Kurt, you're not lining up. This is basically, I'm reading this text, and I was asking the question, 
what does a healthy spirit-led ecosystem look like? What are the things that need to take place? So we're going to look at other places in the Bible, but I want to be clear. This is just one kind of thing that a church is supposed to look like. Churches are unique. God makes each church unique, and some churches are going to look different than other churches. That's totally fine. But what I'm saying is, what does it look like for redeem? And what are some things, that, some elements that it takes for all you all to thrive? There's no formula or equation, but rather a vision for looking at a healthy spirit-led church. So what we see is we look at 1 Corinthians. Paul first outlines these positions or these people or these giftings, okay? And so we look at this. The, the church has to have these giftings or this important part of the health of the church and the movement of the church, Okay, so the health of the church and the movement of the church. And then he's going to talk about these particular gifts, things that have to happen within that. And we'll talk about a couple different thoughts of these in particular because there are a lot of different thoughts in particular on these verses. And, but the key is this. Everyone has a role to play. Okay, believers, we have a common purpose. The common purpose is advancing God's kingdom here on earth as it is in heaven. The common purpose is making Jesus known. The common purpose is transforming lives into the kingdom so that they can have salvation. Okay? And so that's God's whole point. Everything directs back to Jesus. And so our spiritual giftings, our works, our, all that stuff points back to Jesus and bringing people into the kingdom. All this is the purpose of the community spreading the gospel and growing in faith. So let's dig in. 1 Corinthians 12, 27, 28. Now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. And God has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healing, helping, administrating, and, uh, and various kinds of tongues. Okay? This sounds like the most exciting verse that you could ever break down, all right? We're going to break this down, and we're going to look at this as a body, okay? We talked about this last week. The first line here, the church belongs to Christ. You belong to Christ. You as individuals belong to Christ. The church belongs to Christ. We are the body. Everything that we do in the body and to the body is not doing it to one another. It's actually doing it to Christ, okay? Okay? This is how important this is. The church is a community of individuals, but we are the body. And so it's an important thing that the church is, is, must maintain the values of Jesus. We are his body. And so a healthy spirit-led church must be committed, first and foremost, to the lordship of Jesus Christ. The lordship of Jesus Christ. Now, verse 28, there, there's a lot of different ways to look at this verse. There's two ways in particular to look at this verse. The, the first one is, is what we see is that there's a number that's attached to the first three, okay? It says first, second, and third, right? So first, second, and third. So there's a number that's attached, okay? And so there's two ways that, to look at this. There are appointed gifts or people that have this thing that they're supposed to operate within the church. The priority implies the numbering. It could refer to... Uh, the hierarchy, how, how you're supposed to look at these people. And, and a lot of theologians think it's that. It could also look at the order or, the, or, or how these things are supposed to work in order for a church to advance. And there's a lot of it, but there's chronological or there's hierarchical. There's two ways to look at this. I did a lot of studying, just so you know, I worked on this for a lot. But there's a lot of ways to look at it. The first way is hierarchical. The second is first, second, and third. But hear me say this. It's important when we look at it in the, in the, in the, in the text that first and foremost, there is an honor that is put in place of leadership in the church. I want to put that there. There is, there is honor that has to do that. Now, I will say this. It's abused a lot. And I, I, don't, I want to be very careful on that because there is an honor, but that's just to honor leaders. There's, uh, the hierarchical is one way of looking at it, but I, I want to be able to talk about that. But it, I'm thinking that it might be both. And the reason I say this, as, as Paul only can, the truth is that God appoints these, these people with these giftings to play leadership roles within the church. But at the same time, there is almost like this chronological order, and we're going to talk a little bit about this, of how the church is to operate and to move forward. Paul, we, we see this, for a church to happen in the early church, 
like the church in Corinth, there had to be people starting the church, okay? Just like this church, there had to be people starting the church. And, and so there's, this, 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 there's these giftings of these people that are starting things, and today there are new churches happening as well. So people are called to advance God's kingdom in a set area, a set location, or a people group that need to hear the gospel. Okay, so that's the goal. And God has appointed them into the church. Okay, so God is doing the work. Uh, again, God called each of you into Redeem to use your spiritual giftings. I, I feel very confident about that because at Redeem, we're not the best or really focused on marketing or pulling out flyers or anything like that. Everyone was called into here to use their giftings to advance the kingdom. But people are getting called to advance God's kingdom. And the first part of the verse is mission critical. God has appointed them into the church. Every spirit-led church has God appointed groups of people and giftings for what? To advance the kingdom here on earth. And so structure and how the church operates is vitally important. All right? We can't just be willy-nilly on how this thing operates. He, he says this, first apostles. Now here's the second point. Of different thoughts okay so I'm gonna lay this out and I'm just gonna talk about the different thoughts then we're gonna go go in deep but it says second first apostles now in the first century the Apostles included the 12 disciples okay so those were the Apostles but others like James and Barnabas and Paul as well right and, and so in the New Testament it could be read that the Apostles were specifically sent out or commissioned by Jesus okay that's, that's important to note. But there are times like others, like Barnabas, he's listed in Luke as an apostle in Acts 14. And so we see these apostles in these early church, the twelves and others, were critical to starting the church. It's incredibly important to know. I'm not making a theological standpoint. I'm just saying there are people who started the church. That's how this worked, right? They were commissioned by D Jesus. Now, the dividing line is this, and I did some study on this and, and just, just thinking. The dividing line is there are some churches that have these like roles of apostles, like this is the apostle. And now, that's where it gets tricky because it, the apostles are the ones that started it, right? But is there a role for the apostle? Now, where I land, we in Redeem are the continual work of the apostles. That's what's crazy, right? We're the continual work of the churches that first were happening, right? They're, they're, that's the truth. The apostles started the church, and we are a continuation of that church. Amen? Amen. But you can also read this word apostles, maybe, and read it, and it's, it's translated simply as this, ones who are sent out. Okay? Ones who are sent out. This is the literal translation of the word, word meaning those sent by God for the purpose of leading his people usually into a new realm or a new area or a new sphere of influence, okay? This could mean, this means that they go out to spread the gospel to declare Jesus, to places where Jesus wants to move. And we see this to be active in the church, right? We see this, there's prayer and the Holy Spirit will call people out to go advance God's kingdom, okay? So I look at this as a healthy spirit church, there are times where people are going to be sent out of here. Now, the role thing is a whole controversy thing, but for me, it's looking at it and saying, these people are called out to the next thing. I believe, and I've said this over and over again to our elders, it's hard to believe as we meet here with a window through our lobby friends, hello, my friend, lobby friends, but uh, we are going, I believe that there will be churches that get planted out of Redeem. I believe that some of you are going to be sent out out of here. Okay, uh, I look at Jen and Jonah. Jen and Jonah have been called or through Redeem. They're out in Uganda. They say, we are going to do this, 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 this movement, this kind of mi missionary kind of focus where we're going to plant, we're going to put uh, wells in Uganda and we're going to spread the gospel in Uganda. I believe that there might be times where we're called to revitalize a church. I don't know when, but I know that God wants more churches, not less churches in this community. And so some of us might be sent out to revitalize a church. There is this level of being sent out. But I do believe that there will be times where we'll be sent out. Because the, because the original apostles went first. When we as a church start something, there is this getting called out. Okay, So that's where I want to land on this. 
it's controversial on both ends. I, I land on that there is still a place where God is calling people out. And so we see that. This is where people are starting stuff. Now, the second you see is this gift of prophets, right? It says second prophets. Now, this can be a question based on different upbringings or denominations. Some of you had a role of prophet, right? I believe that there is active prophetic ministry that's happening within the church. I do. Matter of fact, we saw it on Thursday. We had about 30 uh, uh, people getting prayed over and there was uh, for Alpha. It was an amazing experience. And there were things that got revealed in that prayer time that spoke into people's life and got words and there were prophetic stuff that happened that was amazing that literally transformed people's lives. Like they're literally calling and texting me saying, I got to sort through this kind of stuff, okay? There is this prophetic gifting. I think there are people with a gift of prophecy, and I think it's important to the growth of the church. Remember, we talked about prophecy earlier, and I encourage you to rewatch that sermon, but we find it that there's people with the gift of the, uh, prophecy is simply an utterance of the Holy Spirit, an utterance of what the Holy Spirit wants to do, okay? So it's declaring sin, it's calling out sin, it's calling people to salvation, it's calling people to conviction. It's also calling people to what does this look like for you? So individual people within the body, right, might get a prophetic word or a, a foretelling or something about them that the Lord wants to speak and call out, okay? And so what we see is that God has a desire within the body to speak to them. And the Holy Spirit-led church, these are active, okay? These are active. I put it in the first one. This is vision, this is vision. A healthy spirit-led church has to have vision. And it's not coming from a strategic plan, in my opinion, from just a group of elders or a group getting together. No, no, no. It's actually, are we seeking God? And is he, is he speaking to us? Is he sending some of us out? Is he starting new ministries? I think he's going to start new ministries through this. I, I really do. And is he speaking through a prophetic gifting to call people out? to give them more vision so that everyone is thriving. So for a church to be healthy and spirit-led and to be thriving, there clearly has to be vision. I want to make the case that it's God-given vision, okay? And that's what we're talking about. What we see is these giftings are, are, are active. There is a preferred future that is getting spoken to the body. What we're doing right now is today. What we have to be focusing on is, Lord, what are the territories, what are the places, what are the ministries that you want us to do to advance your kingdom? That's the question that's always on our heart as a church leadership, okay? And we know this, that vision is important. In Proverbs 29, 18, where there is no prophetic version, vision, the people cast off restraint, but blessed is he who keeps the law. In this proverb, we see the importance of divine revelation for a nation's well-being. Without it, people can make serious mistakes. So all this vision is calling people back to the Lord. And God's word, it says here, is the ultimate guidepost. And it says here, blessed is he who what? Keeps the law. He who follows the word. Where there's no prophetic revelation of the truths of God, the people abandon the restraints of God's law. Does that make sense? The Spirit is the Holy Spirit and God in, is speaking to us as a church to say, here's the vision, here's what I want you to do. And it's all calling people back to Him. It's all calling people back to Jesus. It's all calling people back to the Word of God. And He's setting this into motion. But if not, then the people cast off their restraint, right? We see that. Now, the, the third thing we see here is teachers. These are people who uh, impart God's truth and explain God's truth to God's people, okay? There has to be teachers within the church. There has to be. And it's important to know that when we look at this stage, stage, we think this is teaching. What I'm doing is teaching. And I think that there is some truth to that, right? There is teaching that's happening here on the stage. But within a healthy spirit-led church, there should be teaching happening all over the place, that's why it's so important to have teachers within the community because there's teaching that should be happening all over the place. And if we're actively using these gifts, we should not just be teaching with our words, but we should be saying, come and see. Come and see. 
Come and see how we move the gospel. Come and see how we preach the good news. Come and see how we do prayer ministry, right? Come and see how we worship. It's, if you've ever raised kids, it's the most important thing. I, I use my words all the time with kids, but it's not until they come and see that they understand what's happening. It's also why when we get the bigger uh, auditorium, we're going to have the kids up here for worship, and we're going to have the kids up here because they need to see what does this community look like because they're looking and they're getting taught every day, and not, not just with their words, but they're getting taught by each of our actions. Now, it's important to get this right because there's a great responsibility of teaching. Look at it this way. It says, James 3.1 says this, not many should become teachers, my brothers, because you know that, you, that we will receive a greater judgment. There is serious stuff within teaching. And it's why we have to be very protective of it as a spirit-led church. Uh, because it's very important that as a church, we understand who are the people that are teaching and how are they imparting. Okay? Because it says this, Hebrews 5.12. In fact, though by this time, you ought to be teachers. You need someone to teach you the elementary truths of God's word all over again. You need milk, not solid food. The writer is very harsh here. He's saying just because you've been doing this a long time, it's because you've been doing this a long time doesn't mean you're ready to teach. Matter of fact, some people need to be retaught the basics of the word. It's crazy, but it's true. Spiritually speaking, teaching people God's truth, teaching people how, to, how these gifts operate, teaching people how we are to live, this is not to be taken lightly. That's all I'm saying. But we see where there's, dis, there, where there's discipleship happening, where there's life groups, picking the life groups and the people who lead life groups is very important, right? We see this when, when there's leaders of ministries, whenever there's leaders of ministry, we not only need them to teach people how to do the ministry, but we know that they're going to be in a place where they are going to be teaching God's word. It's so important that we pick the spiritually mature here, but it's critical in all the areas of the church for us to become what God fully wants us to do. It enters this next sphere and that's equipping. So there has to be vision, but there has to be equipping. All right, Ephesians 4, 11 through 12 tells us this. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and the teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may, may be built up. Paul is explaining that Jesus has given his church people to lead with this goal, okay? This goal is to not have you all be merely receivers. If you are receivers, you miss it. It's to equip you all to be in an ecosystem where you're thriving, where, you got, where everyone is in the work of the ministry. Everyone is doing the work. Everyone is playing the part, right? Not to build up redeem. I'm going to be very careful when I say that. To advance God's kingdom out there. Advance God's kingdom out there. We should all be equipped to carry out our unique church ministry and our unique ministry to our families, to our coworkers, to our friends. All the church gets involved. The challenge is it can look much more like a football game. I've used this before. 22 people down doing all the work and 70,000 of us just sitting in there watching them do it. Right? It can. It can. But instead, we're all meant to do the ministry. And each of us is employed by Jesus to what? To build up his church. All of us have that calling. Some of us have callings that are like unique to like in the church. But all of us are part of doing God's work. Equipping has to take place in this body. Without it, things go a little sideways. Now, Paul then goes on to list other giftings to take place in the, bo bo the body. So we're going to see these. So now he's saying, okay, these things set up. Someone's got to start it. There has to be the, these prophetic words that are, uh, there's prophetic ministry that's happening within the church. There's this vision that's happening. People are preaching, they're imparting. But then also there's this teaching, there's this equipping, right, that needs to take place. And then we see the next gifts. And there are many more that can be listed here, but he mentions miracles, 
We talked about this. The Greek phrase here is this gift of extraordinary or extravagant or extraordinary activities. These, these miracles that happen. And, and, it, and it's really strange, but it, like when I was studying it, it's, it's this idea, this Greek word, like exercising demons, like, ex, like exorcisms and raising people, like these miracles that are happening. And we see it in the early church, right? We see crazy things happening. No joke stuff. It doesn't necessarily mean healing, but it could mean healing as well. But then the next thing he sees is this gift of healing, this gift that's given to somebody to restore somebody, right? The Greek term here is, it could refer to physical, or it can also be to spiritual restoration. This gift is restoring someone back to health or well-being or reconciling them back to God. This is the ultimate healing, right? If you've ever been far from God, you know that there is great healing that takes place when you're reconciled back to him. The next helping. Now, as you look at the translation of this, this one's powerful. The Greek word here is not just assisting people, although it is, but it also entails this idea of calling upon God in a time of turmoil. We have helpers in this church, and I'm greatly thankful for it. We have people who are doing the work to reach out to their neighbors all the time. We have a helping church. We also have prayer warriors that, man, I tell you what, when there are challenges within this property, when there's ways that we need God to move, they are able to call on the name of the Lord and he may act in a situation with his full power and force. And so that's what it's saying. Then, then we see administrating. And the word here is, is the only place that's used in the New Testament, but it's like saying a captain or a shipmaster. Like literally someone who has the gifting to provide guidance and direction to the church community. It's, crazy. It's, it's incredible. And then we see the gifting of tongues, and we went into great detail on that, so I'm not going back on that one, all right? Y'all can watch that one. Now, when talking about this ecosystem, it comes to this third sphere. And this third sphere is kingdom transformation. If there's vision, if the Lord's laying on our hearts, hey, here are the ministries that we want you to do. Here are the things that you need to call out in your body. Here are the, the, the people that we need to orchestrate on this. And then we have equipping. We have people who have these giftings or people who are able to teach God's word. And we say, here's how you're equipped to do this stuff. Ultimately, there's kingdom transformation that happens. Evangelism starts happening. Outreach starts happening. Uh, administration, guidance starts happening for people in their lives. Hospitality, the gifts of hospitality start happening. We see healing start to happen. We see help start to happen. There's kingdom transformation that is happening. If there's vision and there's equipping, the Lord is going to use it and there is going to be kingdom transformation because that's what his heart is. His heart is people coming to know Jesus. And so what we see is that if the gifts are activated, all these things we'll start to see. Now, it's not exhaustive. This is not exhaustive. This is literally just how my brain worked when I was reading this, this, these scriptures and other scriptures. But you see these spheres that have to take place, and I hope you feel it here at Redeem, that's beginning to take place in this. Now let's turn into uh, Acts 20, because there's a bottom line there that we need to fill in the place. There's an important layer, a layer that we talk about a, a lot, but it's vitally important. For a truly, for a healthy spirit-led ecosystem, it's important for there to be overseers and elders that do certain things to make things happen. They have to make sure it happens. Paul is speaking to the elders of Ephesus, and he's, he's about to head back to Jerusalem. He tells them this, look, I don't know what's going to happen to me there, okay? He's like, I'm going back to Jerusalem. I don't know what's going to happen to me there, so I'm going to say this last thing to you, okay? So Acts 20 He's speaking to the elders of Ephesus. And he says, Acts 20, 28 through 31, keep watch over yourselves and all the flock of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Be shepherds of the church of God, which he, brought, he bought with his own blood. I know that after I leave, savage wolves will come in among you and will not spare the flock. Even from your own number, men will arise and distort the truth in order to draw away disciples after them. So be on your guard. Paul is saying to these elders to be sober-minded watchmen over the people of God. And he's going to invoke Jesus' imagery, right? Jesus 
called himself the good shepherds and he called the disciples sheep. And he's saying as overseers of the church, hear this, you bear the responsibility of King Jesus's flock. It's important. He's saying as overseers of the church, you have to remember that the sheep cost Jesus his life. This is how critical this work is. So to be this church that God wants us to be, we have to have uh, ministry leaders willing to take on this call. We have incredible elders. I, I, Tony's out sick, but Tony, uh, John, Mark, myself, we sit as the elders here. This is very sobering verses for us, okay? Because we are called first and foremost to guard, love, and lay down our lives for each one of you. That's our calling. That's what Paul is saying to the church, the elders in Ephesus. Are you willing to guard? Are you willing to love? Are you willing to lay down your life for them? Because we see it right here. The world is going to seek to destroy this. And it's probably going to come from the inside. That's what it's saying, which is crazy. So elders and overseers are to pay careful attention. The roles of the overseers are to protect, encourage, and discipline the flock. I use that, I use that lightly. I mean, I don't use that lightly. Th these are the tough things that we have to do. The encouraging part's the easy part. Like, can we pull up that? I don't know if that's up there, the slide on the bottom, what we have. Now, in addition, it's interesting because as much as it talks about the roles of the overseers of the church, what's very, very interesting is that we see that character matters as much, if not more. First, First Timothy 3, therefore, an overseer must be above reproach, the husband of one wife, sober-minded, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not a drunkard, not violent, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. He must manage his own household well with all the dignity, keeping his children submissive. For if someone does not know how to manage his own household, how will he care for God's church? He must not be a recent convert or he will become puffed up with conceit and fall into the condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must be well thought of by outsiders so that he may not fall into disgrace, into the snare of the devil. Nearly all of these listed are characters rather than skills. Isn't that interesting? The chief competencies, um, competencies, man, I nailed that, for overseers are character traits. We often look at a church and we look at the giftedness of the leader. We say, is this guy got it? Does this girl have it? And, but what instead it's saying is it's saying, whoa, 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 whoa. I desire a church to have leaders who have high character. This Sunday service may be amazing. I'm telling you, may be amazing. Ours getting there. But we do meet in this, in this room but it's about the character of, of the leader. When we look at giftedness, we completely miss it. We have to have the ability to manage ourselves, our house, and the house of God. And the overseers of the church must have a deep care for God's church. The New Testament church is constantly calling the church and equating the church to a family. A family. And so Paul's laying this out as well. This is the household of God. This is the family. Are we willing to lay down our lives for all of you like we would the family? That's what it's asking. And what's the problem is, is that today's world, the church is usually following business best practices. So what happens is they say, hey, how do we grow this thing? How do we make everything shiny and sparkly and the right stuff? And you say, and, and the people in this pew say, hey, this dude's gifted. That, that, guy, that, that person can preach. We're in it. We're in it to win it. But then they never ask the character question. Or they never like say, okay, what is, the, what is my role within this church and how am I thriving? 
But we see this again. To be a healthy, spirit-led church, we have to have overseers that are willing to protect, encourage, and discipline the flock, to have the character that God desires them to have. Now, we've been talking a lot about this, a healthy, spirit-led church, and what it is. What, what would it look like? And let's pull up this graphic. Let's ask this question, what does it not look like, okay? So I'm going to end here. What it doesn't look like is one person or a small group of people doing all this. That's what it doesn't look like, okay? It, one of the challenges is, is that sometimes we say, hey, the pastor or the church staff is responsible for all of these bubbles, okay? And that's not how it's supposed to happen. But what we see is that, we, that it's not, it's because we don't have the giftings. So like even within a small group, we may not have the giftings or one person may not have the giftings, but also we don't have the ability to make it scalable, right? So some of you are called into these things. Some of you have a prayer ministry. Some of you have a prophetic uh, gifting where you can pray and you can hear things from the Lord. That's great. Some of you have, we know that there's teachers within this group, right? We know that there are people willing and able to teach. Some from stage, some in life groups, some in different ministry areas, right? And so it's important that not all of us are just equipping. All of you using your giftings for kingdom transformation, right? But if we say, you know what, one person's got it or one small group of people's got it, then that's the problem. Number two, if there are alternative motives beyond building up the body of Christ and advancing God's kingdom. If there are motives and anybody in leadership in this church that's outside of the goal of advancing God's kingdom, we're going to completely miss this. It goes from, un, from healthy to unhealthy very, very, very quickly, if you've ever felt that. I mean, it might have been this. We have to be a group of people pursuing health, pursuing Jesus. And I'm telling you, I'm telling you, the good news is I've been part of a lot of churches. I've been a part of a lot of ministries. The, the, the leadership team here, both the board and the advisory council and, the, and the, the people who are on staff and all the different pieces, it's very, it's very important. They have that heart. They have that heart. And I think that's why the Lord is doing something unique here. Because I think he's saying, hey, chase after me with your heart. Don't worry about skills. So even as we talk about the giftings, it's not a skill thing. It's, it's saying, who, do you have the heart and you have the willingness to pursue Jesus? And if you do, I promise you this will, that kingdom transformation will happen. Number three, equipping is setting up. Equipping is set up, but there's no one willing to do the work. I've seen this. <laughs> Churches with like the greatest system that I've ever seen. But then it's just like crickets when it's like, hey, we need somebody for children's ministries to teach the kids. Or, hey, we need volunteers for youth. Or, hey, we need worship, or we need sound, or we need X, Y, or Z, or we need uh, people to go on this outreach event. And, and so there's like, I want to equip, but like nobody's willing to say yes. Thank God we don't have that problem here. Uh, I really don't think we do. But as we build this, we have to build this up. So in 2023, I just want to point this out. Because of all the craziness that's happened with post-COVID, moving to this building, managing all kinds of building projects. We've had to live in the vision space. Have you felt that? Part of it's where God has us. I'm just going to be honest. But as we build this thing, and hopefully we're going to get up there in the next couple of months, but as we build this thing and as we, we move to this, this equipping part is vitally important. I think in 2023, we as a team will be focusing on the equipping part because we, 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 we know exactly where God has located us. We know what God is calling us to in these neighborhoods. And so we're, we're building up that equipping muscle. Now the question is, and the question for you all is, are you ready? Do you want to be in a place where you thrive, where you're, where you're, where the, where the people are like, man, not, I'm going to see God do something that's actually scary because it's way more easy to stay comfortable. But when we get into the kingdom transformation sphere, this is where it gets uncomfortable. There's no good way to sell that sphere. I would love to say, you know what? God is going to move and you're also going to get three hours of Netflix every night. <laughs> That's not how it works. Say, so he says, are you willing to lay down your life for your brother, your sister? 
Are you willing to have awkward conversations with your family and your coworkers and your neighbors? Are you willing to come on a Saturday night or on a Saturday and hand things out to the homeless in the city or whatever, whatever it comes? Are you willing to give one or two hours to donate to the whatever ministry that the Lord starts popping out of here? But I'm telling you, if you've ever been part of Kingdom Transformation, if you've ever been around somebody that goes from here to hear, and, he, and they love Jesus all of a sudden, and their life is transformed, and there's an energy to it. The Lord wants to do that in the church, but it takes vision, it takes equipping, and it takes everyone doing the work. And it also takes this foundation of overseers, the advisory council, the, board, or the, the elders, and, and the staff that are willing to lay down our lives for each one of us. I will say this, they are doing that. You can feel good about that. But if we want to be part of this church, this, this, this church that, that begins to see uh, radical things happen, and, and when I say that, I mean really good things happen, but not like, oh, there's just kind of some new people going and blah, blah, blah. No, like literally I was this, and now thanks to the ministry that God has placed on this place, I am now this. It's going to take all of us doing it. So a healthy spirit-led church is not when we come to worship and we all get some cold chills if the spirit is here, right? Nothing to do with that. It's just saying, Lord, I'm here and I want to be equipped and I want to use my giftings and I want to use my influence and I want to advance God's kingdom because I know that out there in the streets and in my own family, people are dying. People are so far from God and to be a healthy, spirit-led church, kingdom transformation will happen. But it, all of us saying, I'm in. I'm in, I'm in, I'm in, I'm in, I'm in. Myself included. So go ahead and stand up. If we earnestly pursue holiness on the inside, on the, each one of us, that, that's not perfect people. That's not all of a sudden you're perfect. No, it's saying I'm pursuing God with my whole being. And then we spend all our energy outside saying we need to bring people into the kingdom of God. And we say, if you come, if you come, you will experience the living God. You will experience Jesus. You will encounter Jesus like you've never felt before. There'll be revelations of who God is. There'll be conviction and repentance in people's hearts. And together, we'll see can kingdom transformation. So let's pray. Heavenly Father. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have uh, called each of us into this ministry that we call Redeem. Lord, we're simply this. A group of people pursuing you and Heavenly Father, as we come together, as we pursue you together, Lord, we thank you for what you have already done, and we thank you in advance for what you are doing. Heavenly Father, we, our desire is to know you more and to make you know more. Lord, I pray for each person as we enter into this Thanksgiving. Lord, as we enter into a time where we'll be around uh, people from all different walks of life, some who pursue you deeply, some who are so far from you. I pray, Lord, that we would just be praying this week, that we would be a, a church committed to praying for those who do not yet know you. And Heavenly Father, that each one of us would understand our part. If there's anybody in here right now who doesn't understand their part or who doesn't have a vision for their part within the kingdom of God, and within the, the, re, the redeemed church, I pray, Lord, that you would begin to reveal in them what you see in them. Because, Heavenly Father, you called each of us into the ministry. When we were far from you, you called us in. You saved us from our sin. And then you said, go and make disciples. So we pray that each person will get that vision. We praise your name, in Jesus' name, amen.